began in chapter 4 touching on our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who has come according to the order of Melchizedek and that was picked up again at the end of chapter 6 and then last week we considered in general what it meant to come according to the order of Melchizedek uh, which is to say to come as both a king of righteousness and peace and a priest of the most high God, a priest who intercedes for his people forevermore. And we continue now the uh, discussion of um, the superiority of our Lord Jesus Christ to all that has gone before him as he is of the order of Melchizedek. And so it's chapter 7 and verse 11, reading down to verse 19. And just before we read again, I'm going to pray for the Lord's help. Our Father in heaven, we do pray for your help as the word of God is read amongst us and as it is preached. Lord, help me to be faithful and not to speak any error, any falsehood. Help me to show your people the truth of this passage and and what it means for us. And I pray, Lord, that under the ministry of your word, we all would be strengthened in our faith and that we would be encouraged ever more to look to Jesus Christ, the great author and finisher of our faith. May he be glorified, O God, in our hearing of the word of God now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life, for he testifies you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Amen. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Um, Or consider Psalm 73. The psalmist reflecting on the prosperity of the wicked, almost slipping in his confession of the God of Scripture, says, when I thought how to understand this Psalm 73, 16, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. And having gone into the sanctuary of God and the presence of God, he discerned the end of the wicked and he was comforted. But more than that, he came to that blessed experience uh, described in Psalm 16, the fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. And he says in Psalm 73 and verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. 
Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If we could enter the presence of God, then we could know this great fullness of joy and delight and satisfaction. And even on the very darkest of days, we're told that if you were to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you would fear no evil. Why? For God is with you. His rod and his staff, they they comfort you. You see, the key to happiness and satisfaction in this life is being able to draw near to God, drawing near to the one who understands you, who knows you better than you know yourself, to draw near to the one who loves you with a holy, pure, and unchanging love. To draw near to God is worth more than anything else you could possess in heaven or on earth. Can you draw near to God? That's the subject this morning, you can, and how is it that you draw near to God? Well, that's what we're going to explore this morning. And we begin following the argument of the text. Uh, First, first point, by considering the imperfections of the Levitical system. Considering the imperfections of the Levitical system, verse 11, therefore... If perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? The first thing he says here is that the Levitical priesthood goes hand in hand with the whole Levitical system, the ceremonial law. You have a priest so that he can officiate at the altar of the Lord. The washings, the sacrifices, the tabernacle, all of that goes hand and glove with the Levitical priesthood. And so if there is a change in the priesthood, he says in verse 12, then of necessity there is a change in the law, that is, in the ceremonial law. The whole system changes. The second thing he says in verse 11 is that God has decreed that that system would change. As we've been going uh, through this exposition of Psalm 110, we're reminded that God has appointed a Messiah who will come according to the order of Melchizedek. And so the system is going to change. And what follows is if the system changes, that can only be because there were deficiencies within the system. If perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there be that a priest should arise according to a different order, according to the order of Melchizedek? It's a bit like when uh, Apple bring out a new iPhone. If they bring out the iPhone 12 or the iPhone 13, of necessity, what does that say about the predecessor, the old model? that it has been improved upon and it has been enhanced in this new model. If it hadn't been improved upon and it hadn't been enhanced, then nobody would buy the new iPhone, but they do. The same is true of the new system that has been brought in with the Messiah who has come according to the order of Melchizedek. He has brought with him something better because there were deficiencies within the old system. And this is much more than a hypothetical because, as the author goes on to say, our Lord Jesus Christ has come of the order of Melchizedek, but also of the tribe of Judah. Verse 13, for he of whom these things are spoken, the one the whole letter is about, belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Now, if this is true, then, what that means is that a seismic change has been brought about for the people of God. The entire external religious order has been transformed, if this is true. The entire culture that was built around that system has been transformed, if this is true. And that is a hard pill to swallow. 
that system was venerated and was familiar to the people of God and to the Christians who had come to know Jesus Christ. The Jews outside of Christ were protesting the Christians that this is blasphemy to turn aside in any sense from the laws of Moses as an unholy and an evil thing to do. And so the Christians must be persecuted. And for the Jewish Christians that the author is writing to, they're wrestling with this same issue themselves. They have left Jerusalem. They've left the old order and they have embraced the new. But were they right to do so? Everybody around them is telling them, no, they're wrong and they should come back to that old order. They should embrace again the Levitical system that came through faithful Moses. You understand that for them to become a Christian, this is a bit like the experience. Of course, it's much more radical, but it's a bit like the experience of when you leave home for the first time. When you're in your mother's home, there's, there's security and there's order. She, she cooks for you. She cleans for you. She, she pays and organizes the bill for you. And when you leave home for the first time, all of that lands on you. And that freedom, which is good, can be an overwhelming experience for the young man or the young woman who leaves his parents' home. My parents can testify that when I first left home, I was never away from home. I moved out, but I was always there, snaffling the food, having meals, bringing washing over. It was a hard thing to let go of all of the comforts and the security of my parents' home. But the key to making the adjustment was beginning to appreciate the freedom and the beauty of the new mature state that I'd been brought to as an independent man and the deficiencies for my current state of maturity of going back to that home. For example, imagine if when I was courting Anna, I was still back there in my parents' home and in my bedroom. And what I said to her is, Anna, you know, uh, I think we have a great future together in the Lord. And I've got some good news for you. I've got this bedroom in my mom and dad's house and we can raise a family there. And my mother's going to be there to wash our socks and, and, and to make our breakfast and all of these, these things. She'd have run a mile. But what I understood was I had to leave my parents' home in order to move on to that new level of maturity to be in the position to be married and to begin a home of my own. And it's this that the Christians he writes to, they, they need to come to this appreciation of the newfound maturity and the blessing of their new condition and of the deficiency of the old one so that they wouldn't go back to it. Now, in what sense could we say that the Levitical system was deficient? Well, he tells us that it couldn't lead us on to perfection. To talk about perfection is to talk about completeness or sufficiency, but to do what? Well, we're told in verse 19, to allow us to continue to draw near to God. It was insufficient to allow us to continue to draw near to God. And it's important to say that to continue because what we're not saying is that there was no drawing near to God through the Levitical system. But what we are saying is that it was limited in time, as per Psalm 110, it would be superseded when he comes of the order of Melchizedek. And it was limited in time because, and this is the point in verse 11, it was limited in its effect. The people could draw near to God, but there were limitations on their drawing near to God. There was less immediacy and therefore less intimacy with God in the Levitical order. If you were living then as one of God's people, you would come to God through priests and through Levites, through tents and through cloth and through animals. There was less freedom. Your relationship was maintained through precise religious rituals. And it was geocentric. It was focused on Jerusalem. Three times a year, the men would have to present themselves at the temple. There was less freedom in that relationship with the Lord, and there was less assurance. And this is the big one 
that the author is going to go on to explain in the subsequent, uh, the rest of this chapter and in the chapters to follow. How could you ever have complete peace and assurance under that old system? When you are presented with the promise of a sacrifice to take away your sins, but the animals keep being slaughtered morning and night, day after day, when you look to the priest and he himself is sinful and mortal, he dies and another one comes, at what point would you ever say, God has truly provided an atonement for me? You couldn't. And you're left with, yes, faith in the promises, yes, faith in the one who is to come, but never quite seeing that the atonement had been made, never quite knowing that the blood that you needed to wash the stain of sin from your soul had come. Both by experience and by decree of God, the Jewish Christians knew that perfection had not come through that old system. The big question for them then is, had it come through the new? Had perfection come? And that's our second point and second question. Is there perfection through Jesus Christ? You see, the implication of verse 11, perfection couldn't have been through the Levitical priesthood, otherwise it wouldn't have been superseded by one according to the order of Melchizedek, is that if you have a savior who has come according to the order of Melchizedek, he has brought with him perfection. But the question is then, is Jesus of the order of Melchizedek? And there's an awful lot that is hanging on this question. The author has already touched on the elephant in the room when he says in verse 14 that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Now, on one hand, the fact that our Lord has arisen from Judah is a cause for rejoicing. Remember 2 Samuel 7 and the Davidic covenant? It was already quoted at the beginning of this letter. is a cause for great rejoicing. The greater son of David is going to come and he's going to bring with him the everlasting kingdom that will never pass and will never be destroyed. Praise the Lord for that. But that he is of the tribe of Judah has problems associated with it for Israel, because the priesthood and the kingship were always distinct and always kept separate. And so if our Lord has come of the tribe of Judah, how then can he be the great priest of his people? Well, he can be if he is of the order of Melchizedek, because the order of Melchizedek, as we discussed last week, is an office of both kingship and of priest. Melchizedek is a king of righteousness and peace, and he is the priest of the most high God. And so if Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, then we have both a king and we have a priest and we have the one who has brought that perfection, the one through whom we can continue to draw nearer to God in a fuller and a richer way that could not have been experienced until his coming. If he is of the order of Melchizedek, then as he says in verse 18, on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. If Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, we have that better hope through which we, through which they can continue drawing near to God. So is he of the order of Melchizedek and how would you know? Well, the key to the answer of that question is given in verse 15 and 16. It is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to to the power of an endless life. How do we know that Jesus has come according to the order of Melchizedek? Because he has come with the power of an endless life. Remember, that was the great emphasis on Melchizedek, that he was presented in chapter 7 and verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. 
if he has come according to the power of an endless life, then we know that he is of the order of Melchizedek. But how do we know this? And the answer is the resurrection, the very center of our faith, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he uses an interesting word. He doesn't say one who has come according to an eternal life as though he were referring exclusively to the eternal sonship of our Savior. But what he says is one who has come according to an indestructible life. That's a funny way to describe eternity, unless you are wanting to make the point that his is a life that could not be destroyed, could not be crushed, could not be quenched. And you see, you can't see the eternity of the Son, but what you can see is his indestructible life. Where and when? When all the forces of darkness fell upon him with all of their might and force. When he bore the sins of his people down through every age and the powers of hell fell upon him and he rose again on the third day victorious. It is in the resurrection that you know he has come according to an indestructible life. And these Christians that he's writing to know this, that he, the one who has tasted death for all, Hebrews 2, 9, is the one who rose because they know people, reputable eyewitnesses who saw him alive. And you know it too by faith because you believe these reputable witnesses, men who saw him, women who saw him, the Spirit-inspired scriptures that testify of him. But more than this, you see it in his conquering power down through the ages. A dead man is not able to win souls. And yet we see people from every tribe, nation, and tongue bowing the knee to Christ, testifying that Jesus is alive. And therefore, quite literally, when he says in verse 15, there arises another priest according to the order of Melchizedek, There did arise another priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. In his resurrection, he arose, the priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, the one with the indestructible life. And therefore, what follows is that everything that was deficient, that we described in the old system, is now made perfect in the new, in the one who has come according to the order of Melchizedek. We mentioned that there was less immediacy and therefore intimacy in the old system. Think of the immediacy and intimacy that you have in the new. You don't come to a mortal priest. You come to God in the flesh. And through him, you come directly to God himself. You have unprecedented freedom not restricted in any sense. Wherever you are in the world, you don't need to go to Jerusalem You simply lift up your voice in faith and call upon the Lord your God through Jesus Christ. And in that moment, you have communion with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You don't need to go and prove that you have been washed and that you're now clean. And so then you can be made holy to go before God. You simply call out in faith. And through Jesus Christ, you have access to that great throne room of grace. And whilst there was a lack in assurance, you have full assurance. You don't have to get up each day and see animal after animal being slaughtered. But you look to the one who has offered up his own life for you once and for all. And because he rose and was accepted by God on your behalf as a man, you know that you have been accepted by God. Atonement has been made, for he bore your iniquities, your sins, the whole lot, from beginning to end, including your sin in Adam, and he lives. You have been accepted by God through the crucifixion and resurrection of the Son of God. And you look not to a king or to a priest who will die and be succeeded, but you look to the one king and priest 
who reigns and rules forever and makes intercession for you. Amen. And he's going nowhere. There is a full assurance that is yours in this one, the one who has come according to the indestructible life, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now then, third question, can you draw near to God? The answer is, yeah, you can. Through Jesus Christ, he has brought with him, therefore, verse 19, this is the last part, a better hope through which we draw near to God, through which we continue drawing near to God. But look, here's the point that it must be through Jesus. For those who are wrestling with the temptation of going back to the old system and the old order, his message is clear, that there is nothing for them there. If they were to go back to that old system, it has now been superseded by the order of Melchizedek. They cannot draw near to God through it, they can only draw near to God and continue drawing near to God through Jesus Christ alone. And for you, the message is even clearer. If the old system that was ordained by God fails to allow the people to draw near to God now, then nothing else can, nothing that is unordained of God. There is no other religion. No idol in your life, no superstition, no philosophy, no work, no ritual, no self-actualization that can allow you to draw near to God. Nothing else can work. Nobody can allow you to come into that joyful and blessed presence of God but Jesus alone. Amen. Through Jesus, you can draw near to God. You can know that fullness of joy and the pleasures forevermore. As you draw near to God through Jesus, how do you draw near to God? Through your Lord Jesus Christ. You draw near to him in faith, in his word and promises. When you believe promises like the beginning of book, the book of Hebrews, that God has spoken at various times in various ways to the fathers, but in these last days has spoken to you through his son. When you believe promises like that, you are drawing near to God through Christ. When you believe that he is he has bought that greater salvation that he talks about in Hebrews 2, 3. When you believe that as he ex exposited Psalm 8 in Hebrews 2, that he has reclaimed and is restoring the heavens and the earth and he's giving them to you so that you once again will have all things subjected to your feet. When you believe these promises, you are drawing near to God through Jesus Christ. When you believe, as he says in Hebrews 2 and verse 14, that he has come to destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil. You get to draw near to God through faith in Jesus Christ. When you believe that he has destroyed him who kept you in tyranny through the fear of death, you draw near to God through Jesus Christ. When you believe, as he says in Hebrews 4, 9, 4, 9 that the arrest remains for you, when you believe on this promise, the promise of Christ to you, you are drawing near to God through him. When you believe, as he has described in Hebrews 4 and verse 14, that you have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, who sympathizes with you, then you are drawing near to God through faith in those promises. Through faith exercised in his word and promise, you draw near to God through Jesus Christ. And then, of course, through prayer. Hebrews 4 and verse 16 tells us that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in, in time of need. In prayer through Jesus Christ, your soul is elevated into the dwelling place of God. You, you are taken there in the Spirit by Christ to come before the throne of grace Whenever you lift your eyes to heaven or bow your head or whatever your posture is in prayer, you come into the presence of God. God the Almighty, God the All-Graceful. Grace, and you have communion with him. You draw near to God when you have fellowship with his body, which is the church. It's called his body for a reason. He is the head for a reason. To be in the church is to be under the reign and the rule of Christ. To be in the church and amongst his people is to be amongst those in whom 
Jesus Christ dwells. And when you come together as the church, he tells you that he is here in the midst. When you participate in the worship and the fellowship and the service of the church, you are drawing near to God through Jesus Christ by faith. And then in faithfulness, to walk after Jesus is to walk with Jesus. Remember we said at the beginning of the book of Acts when we were going through that, that Luke begins the letter by saying the former account was about all of the things that Jesus began both to do and teach. And what follows is that Jesus is continuing to do and to teach how he's in heaven through his people. When you are faithful to God and you are faithful to Christ, you could not be any sense any nearer to God this side of glory. When you walk with Christ in faithfulness to his Father, in faithfulness to Christ himself, then Christ himself is working through you and he is with you in your faithfulness. And in all of these ways, you can and are drawing near to God. And the more you pursue this life, faith in his word and promises, prayer, fellowship with his body, and faithfulness, the more that you will enter into that great experience of joy described by the psalmists and the apostles. And so, dear friends, may you all know that abundant peace and hope and love as you continue drawing near to God through Jesus Christ. Not looking back to any old system, not looking to any systems of the world, but coming to the one who has come with the power of an indestructible life, who reigns as your king and priest forevermore. Through him, by faith, you are continuing to draw near to God. May you know his blessed presence. Amen.